author of Genetic Algorithms, um, in a groundbreaking book in 1975 called Adaptation in Natural and Artificial Systems. So he's at the University of Michigan. And the other type of algorithm that we're going to look at, GP, Genetic Programming, this is from John Koza, um, who is a uh, sort of an entrepreneur, researcher. Um, one of the interesting things about this guy is that uh, um, he's responsible for the uh, scratch lottery ticket. So what do you know? Anyway, so he's, he's the fellow who pioneered the use of genetic programming um, as, a, as a way of solving complex problems. And he's at Stanford. Scratch lottery tickets and uh, genetic algorithms. That's uh, not a very broad spectrum at all. <laughs> not at all. No, no. He's, he's innovative. That's the connection. Innovative. So, uh, yeah, if we go to, the, go to uh, slide number six. Um, so, the first thing I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll explain the steps in the algorithms. In this case, genetic algorithms and genetic programming. But these sorts of steps apply to, in pretty much all of these algorithms, they follow roughly some flavor of, of the scheme that I'm about to uh, explain. And so, in order to keep this interesting, I thought, you know, what kind of example can I give you um, that will hold your attention? Because I'm talking about an algorithm. So I thought, well, why don't we uh, you know, pretend that we're uh, trying to evolve the parameters uh, for a condom. So you're some condom manufacturer, and uh, you'd like to really maximize your sales. And so what you're going to do is you're going to call me up and pay me loads of money, and I'm going to come up with uh, a, uh, a genetic algorithm for you to evolve the parameters for your condoms. And so with all of these problems, you, you first come up with some sort of an encoding. So that is, what is it about the condom design that, that you're interested in, in, in changing? What parameters do you want to tweak? And then you lay them out in a linear chromosome. We do use the word chromosome for that. It's just an array of, or a sequence of numbers, essentially. So you come up with some sort of a scheme for turning a design like a condom into a sequence of numbers and vice versa to be able to turn the sequence of numbers into a condom. And so what you might do is you would have maybe the first number represents, uh, you know, the degree of elasticity. And then the second one is whether or not there are stripes and how big are the bumps and whatever. Right. So all the sorts of fancy uh, bells and whistles uh, for condoms, maybe even bells and whistles. So uh, if we go to slide number seven uh, in genetic programming, on the other hand, the, the representation, the underlying genetic code, uh, is, is quite different. Um, and it's not just a, a, a linear string of numbers. Instead, with genetic programming, you always are uh, manipulating tree structures. And on the, uh, on the slide, you can see on the left an example of a genetic programming tree structure. And you can see a bunch of little nodes, um, and they each have, uh, in this case, they each have two nodes coming off of them, and some of them have none. The number of branches uh, is not relevant here. Uh, the key concept is that this tree, in some sense, represents a, a solution to the problem. And so in this case, you can probably, just by eyeballing it, uh, figure out what's going on here. At least I hope. Uh, this tree uh, represents the equation x times 1 plus uh, x minus y over y. So you can see at the top of the tree, uh, you've got the multiplication symbol, the little asterisk. And it's saying, okay, I want to multiply what's on the left, which is x, by what's on the right, which is everything else, the 1 plus x minus y over y. Um, if, you, if you were to sit down and, and look at this tree, I'm sure you'd probably fairly easily get into how this representation works. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the idea is that you've represented the answer to your problem as a tree in this sense. So in, in many cases, it really is a mathematical equation. Um, but in other cases, it can be completely wild and, and, and woolly things. It, it could be a computer program. So there are ways of actually taking a computer program and representing them as trees. Uh, some languages are particularly well suited, computer languages. Some computer languages are particularly well suited um, to that type of encoding. And so this is basically the key essence in genetic programming is you've gone away from this linear chromosome structure and instead you have this type of a tree. And so in this example, um, we have this function which there's a, there's a picture of the surface that's dictated by this function on the right. And then in some sense, we're going to evaluate that surface and see how good it is for some particular problem. For example, we may be getting data from some real-world system, uh, and we'd like to come up with a function that approximates it so we can do some extrapolation. So that, that might be one example uh, where you would use genetic programming. So if we go to the next slide, um, the, the next step in, in all of these algorithms is that you want to come up with a way 
uh, to measure the goodness of your solutions or the quality. Uh, this is called a fitness function. And the measure of goodness is usually just called the fitness. So we steal these words from biology. Um, and so, for example, for the function, you, you have, you, or for the, pardon me, for the condom, you have a way of um, exposing the condom to the real world and coming back with a number, a single value that represents its quality. So this may be, you know, maybe for a month you, you make this condom available in stores and then you see how many are sold, um, for example. But you could come up with any, any way that you like as long as uh, you can take the solution to your problem and convert it into a number that in some way captures the essence of how good of a solution it is. So that's the fitness function. That's a, that's a black box. It's totally up to the person using these algorithms to come up with their own fitness function uh, that's particular to their own problem. And in the example of the genetic programming, uh, like I said, you may have some data coming in from some real-world system, and you want to see how closely uh, your function matches that data. And there are ways to come up with a measure of that. And so that's the second step. If we go to the next slide, uh, the third step is to generate um, a population. So generate a, an initial set, an initial collection of candidate solutions. And the way this is usually done uh, you can come up with variations on this, is, is to simply fill in the genetic codes with random values. And so you'll say, okay, well, this condom has this much elasticity, this many bumps of this size and this color and this flavor and whatever, uh, and then move on to the next one. And again, just they're all completely random. So as pictured in this slide, each of these condoms has their own random settings. And so this is the initial material from which evolution is going to get its first foothold and, and start improving the population. And so, like I say, almost always this is done with, with a random initialization, but um, in any real-world situation, you may have some knowledge about the domain you're involved in that can help you steer this initial population to, instead of just random solutions, solutions that are you know, marginally better than random, or solutions that are already known to work well and you want to evolve from there. Um, all sorts of variations on that idea exist. So if we go to the next slide... The fourth step is to then take your, your population of candidate solutions and subject each one to the fitness function that you created back in, in uh, step number two. And uh, you want to record for each one the fitness value that it attains. And so here, for example, that, uh, that little condom guy on the left has got 15.4, um, but apparently people go bananas for the yellow condom on the right. Uh, with 47.4 fitness, whatever that number means. Maybe it's, you know, million dollars in sales or who knows what, uh, some sort of pleasure rating or, you know, use your imagination. So you want to be able to evaluate all of this population and assign to each one a fitness value. So the next step, if we go to the next slide, is that you want to make a new population. You're going to take your old one and come up with a new one, um, except you're going to use the members of the old population as parents. Um, and so you're going to do some sort, of a, some sort of copying and breeding, some sort of analog to biological reproduction. And so one of the ways that you can do that is with mutation. So that is you, you pick a parent, you make a copy of it, and then you just go into its chromosome, into its genetic material, and make some small random change. And so in this example... Uh, at the bottom, you see we've seen a, a couple A's turn into B's, and then that's going to translate into a different type of condom, but it's still going to be somewhat similar to its parent because the mutations are, in general, small changes. And I say they're random changes in that they're random with respect to the effect that the change is going to have on fitness. So that's one of the ways that you can create a new individual for the new population. If we go to the next slide, one of the other ways is called crossover. This is uh, the equivalent of uh, recombination from biology. And so the idea is you choose instead of one parent, you choose two. And so in the diagram here in the picture, we've got the two parents at the top, parent one and parent two at the bottom. And then we're choosing a location along the chromosome.